everybody. Um, we are live with Dr. Jeanette Hope. And um, Dr. Hope doesn't necessarily know this, but I've been a fan of hers for quite some years. She's just a leader in this field. And I've always just admired, she's been someone on the cutting edge of just writing research and actually getting things published, which we really need to advance the topic of mold and environmental toxicity. And we're going to dive in today to some of those topics, which you know I love to talk about. And I'm so excited to have her on. Um, she's just a gem of a person and really has been involved on in so many levels in this field. So you will um, get to hear her expertise. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that if you um, want other resources, you can always go to my free blog on the website, just my name, jillcarnahan.com. There's weekly all free stuff on there for you about mold and environmental toxicity. And uh, be sure and sign up for my newsletter while you're there. And then we have a brand new free YouTube channel with videos like this. It's just in the YouTube um, and you search my name and you'll find that channel. So go there to find other videos as well. So today I want to introduce my friend, Dr. Jeanette Hope. Um, I'll give you just a little background and then I will um, ask her to tell her story, which is always fun to hear. Um, she's like me, she's a, a family medicine background. So she's board certified in family practice and completed training and certification to become a diplomat in the field of environmental medicine. And she has a certificate through the American Board of Environmental Medicine, which you also served as president. Is that correct? Yes, that is yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. um, and then the American Board of Integrative Medicine, um, like myself, uh, yeah. 2016, I think we did the same year, maybe that, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I think it was the first year they actually became the official board through the AMA. Yeah, yeah. Um, she's also a fellow through the American Academy of Environmental Medicine since 2012, and she graduated from the University of Hawaii um, in uh, 1995 and earn honors. And um, I love that she has that background in family medicine because I do as well. And it just, what's neat is we got this really great basic training. I'm sure you delivered babies like I did in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we did all of it. And what's great now is um, I usually um, treat uh, patients above too, but I know how to treat infants too. And I treat all ages. Um, there's just great pediatricians that do holistic medicine. So I tend to give the, you know, zero to two years old to, to one of them who does a, a great job. But I love having families, especially with environment, because often their whole house is affected. And then the mother and the son and the daughter and everybody, and we can treat them and we know the genetic patterns and stuff. So that's really fun to share. Um, so welcome, Dr. Hope. I'm so glad to have you here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you want me to yeah, so how I got this field? Or, yeah, um, so I always love to start a story because I really think that frames like people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And a lot of times that comes from where we've been in our own journey. So I'd love you to start on just telling us your kind of journey into environmental medicine from family medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I um, uh, did my residency at San, uh, Santa Monica, UCLA and was practicing um uh, general family medicine for uh, first, uh, let's see, 10 years or so. And I would um, probably the one thing that I had the hardest time with were the patients that I knew something was going on and I didn't have the tools to figure it out. I believe them. I listened and um, and I, you know, didn't just prescribe the antidepressant unless it was appropriate, but, you know, I was, I was listening. I wasn't. And, um, and then in 2005, I started to get sick as did uh, many family members. And for me, it was sort of dramatic in the sense that I had a fever every day wow. of 101 to 102, which is not typical. I found out that that's actually not typical, but I, the combination of what was going on in our house and my immune system did that. So that sent me on a journey of uh, many, many specialists um, and <laughs> countless tests. Um, uh, including uh, way too many CT scans and other, yeah. you know, imaging studies that involved um, additional exposures. So this went on for about 10 months. Um, there was, uh, there were two hospitalizations actually, and um, had, oh, I forget, it was eight organs biopsied, everything wow. from <laughs> to esophagus to bone marrow. Um, and everything was abnormal with, you know, some inflammation. Um, they would see, you know, abnormalities. At that point, it was even severe esophagitis, or, um, even a Barrett's diagnosis. And I, um, 
but we couldn't figure it out. You know, we knew something was wrong. And along with the fevers, um, I, you know, ended up experiencing symptoms in practically every part of my body. So I saw specialists of all types. And, um, and in the process of looking for this, um, at the time, with the knowledge that we had, um, we were pursuing the things that we knew, <laughs> including, yeah. you know, weird infections and cancer and, you know, just that's what, you know, uh, we were looking for. And then it became clear that some other family members were having some problems, including our young daughter at the time who got a pneumonia and, um, and, um, and you know but that was um and then she would also get fevers that were kind of unexplained so um i guess as the universe kind of works there'd be people here or there that had thrown out mold you know they talk about physician families yeah. actually locally even and you know they throw it's like yeah and i was really starting to suspect something environmental but i still didn't have mold on the brain you know i thought maybe we put in some flooring and you know, um, and then um, there was a, the day that um, I'd come back from a trip and I didn't think, really think about it. It was a conference in San Francisco and came in the house and practically immediately got a bad headache. And it was later that day that I was in a room and something smelled a little off and I moved a bookshelf and we saw a black spot behind that bookshelf that was really hidden. And in our case, um, uh, all of the mold was hidden because it was all trapped in the walls. The balconies hadn't been put on properly. Wow. And um, it was, you know, kind of pretty close to an envelope of stachybotrys, which could be oh. why I had such a severe reaction. And I also had spent the most time in moldy environments because my workplace was moldy as well. So I, I really got very little break. Um, other family members at least got breaks, you know, going to work in school. So, um, so that was, we happened to have on our bookshelf, a book written by or co-authored by Eric Elliott. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, Pres Prescriptions yeah. for a Healthy House. We'd had a neighbor when we lived in Hawaii who had um, gotten sick from mold and she had given us that book and it was on our shelf. We hadn't thought much about it. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get into Eric Elliott that week. It was our daughter's spring break. And that's sort of where my, um, you know, education in environmental medicine started really. It was to try and help uh, my family and myself. So um, I had no idea how much was out there. This was not anything we were taught um, beyond, you know, if somebody had a rash, you'd ask about shampoos or something. I mean, that was about all, you know, we would, we were trained with in environmental medicine. So I started attending any conference I could find and you know, sort of went through the process that you described of getting additional training. Wow, that is such a story because it highlights so many things that um, we're both conventionally trained and I love that because I feel like I have a great science-based foundation like you and yeah. we've been the very best of conventional medicine, but our toolbox is now bigger. And I love that because it's not that we're not, I don't even ever or like the term alternative. I never use it. I don't consider myself alternative. It's not yeah. true. We are like the best of conventional plus more tools. But what happened is both of us, we were trained in conventional allopathic medicine, which is a great foundation. Um, but there wasn't a lot of training about this innate immune response that you're describing. Um, we were taught about mold allergy and that's about the extent of it and even that was probably like mentioned in passing in a class yeah, um, yeah. so what's what you're describing is so real to all of us and what I also love is um, somehow the divine or the universe was we, we were chosen in a way because I always say I didn't choose mold I would have no. never picked this complicated bit of a topic to know and understand and help patients but it chose me right and it chose you <laughs> because oh, we had to survive to I mean to in order to survive and, and save our family and um, those that we loved we had to learn about it so so interesting. Yeah. Now, what's yeah. really interesting to me is um, I look back and, of course, my big exposure was 2015 in an office that was moldy with stacky batteries, very similar. But then, like you, I look back, you mentioned Hawaii. I wonder if there was previous priming events of exposures over the years prior to get my immune system. And what's interesting to me when I hear your, hear your story is when I presented with Crohn's disease in 2002, right after my cancer, 
the only right. symptom I presented with was those cyclical fevers, exactly like you described. Oh, and they were like one on one. They were like the high, they weren't like a ninety nine five. Yeah. Uh, and I always wonder in that hindsight if there had been some mold in relation to that diagnosis of Crohn's because we know that with mold can lower MSH. And MSH is critical for tight junctions. And we actually see some models in animals um, of an induction of inflammatory bowel disease from mold exposure. So it's very interesting to me. I have no idea. But those yeah. fevers are something I've never heard anyone else besides you and I like present yeah. with them fevers um, in part of it. And, and what happens in conventional medicine, they call it fever of unknown origin. They don't know where it comes from, right? Yeah. So they biopsy everything, they x-ray everything, they see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here it was in your house, right? Like, um, wow, yeah. so the fever, so then you started to get, so you probably obviously had to remediate. Tell me a little bit about the beginning of your journey to get well. How did that go for you? Yeah, so it started with a trip to New Mexico with <laughs> our then six-year-old daughter to see wow. Dr. Eric Elliott because she, you know, was the person I knew and she was able to yeah. get us in and that was awesome and uh, learned so much from her and um, already, you know, when you first get out of a moldy environment, some symptoms lift quickly yeah. and, but, but it takes a while to really restore everything that's, mm -hmm. you know, been thrown off nutritionally and you know the inflammation and everything so it was very clear that getting out was the right thing and it was it was a huge relief actually because you know I had been down this path that was getting worse and worse and uh, we were about at the point where I'd gone to see um, a sarcoidosis specialist a USC very very kind man and um, because of uh, their pulmonary nodules and eye symptoms. And he, he concluded I didn't have um, uh, sarcoidosis, but I likely had chronic fatigue syndrome and I should just apply for disability. And, you know, pretty well, that was it. You know, he, wow. uh, he shared his wife had that too, and he was very kind. And that was, that was great, except it didn't, ring true to me. It didn't make sense that I was who I was before, yeah. uh, which was healthy and very active. And then all at once, you know, a switch flipped and, you know, now I, uh, you know, was going to sort of check out uh, of being able to be healthy and, and work and function. And, um, and I didn't have the answer yet, but I, I knew that that Although clinically, I would have met the criteria for that. Nobody was really talking about looking for causes. And yeah. that's the part that didn't ring true for me. I, you know, I appreciated that, you know, someone could understand how profoundly fatigued and sick you feel. But I, it just wasn't, it wasn't over yet. I, you know, that wasn't the answer. I, I couldn't just accept that something would come out of nowhere and just floor me for the rest of my life. Um, so that part, you know, so we kept looking, my husband's a physician as well. And so we would research everything and, you know, and talk to the doctors and, um, and, you know, I always say I was very fortunate that doctors took me seriously medically because I had a, you know, a very clear objective symptom, which was a fever that could be measured. So um, there was no dismissing it or, you know, sending to psychiatrist or anything. However, that put me through a lot of medical tests um, and a lot of radiation. And, you know, so it's, um, you know, a lot of folks are, really, really discouraged because they've been dismissed and insulted. And, you know, it always amazes me how nervous they are when they come in to see me. And I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm not a scary person, but, you know, I think just the act of having to go to a doctor and tell your story again, yes. and yeah. you know, and then have to see, you know, what, you know, what they're going to say, you know, you can, I, you probably experience that as well. They've been traumatized by, you know, sort of going through the medical system. And so that was um, interesting. So yeah, in, um, in my case, I just wanted to mention uh, one of the last biopsies I got was when there was a skin lesion that had um, kind of popped up a weird looking, nothing very exciting, but we were fishing yeah. for answers and they biopsied it and they saw leukocytoclastic vasculitis, which is kind of a, you know, can be caused by a number of things. Um, 
uh, some meds, but nothing that, you know, I had been on. And um, so that was kind of a clue that something was going on. But what was interesting about that is a few years later, I sent that tissue for mycotoxin analysis. And it was, I think it, the ochratoxin level was 18 parts wow. per the, you know, and the um, and then there was aflatoxin in that lesion as well. So that was an after the fact thing, but it was kind of interesting. So oh, that's so fascinating because that's part of the problem is our testing and diagnosis. Now we know you and I know how to make a diagnosis, and it starts with clinical history and like your story of this environment and then being you know better out of that. And that that's where it starts asking the right questions, and then we can do visual contrast. We can do um, you know just symptom analysis, and then we can go into the testing, um, and then we can talk a little bit about like how you approach it. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of the labs I use for innate immune system, I was never taught those um, in medical school either yeah. so we, yeah we've gotten a lot more information now because if you do a normal um, chem panel with the liver the kidney a lot of times now that can be abnormal it can affect the liver but a lot of times those basic labs even inflammatory labs like CRP or ESR are totally normal in these patients and yet they're very very sick so it's a, like a different pathway that we're looking at that's not common um, now, interesting, do you have any um, hypothesis about the fever and about, I mean, I know trichosethines can affect immune system and cytokines, so I'm guessing you had an actually overactive kind of cytokine response, but what are your thoughts about that fever and how it relates? I, I've always wondered about endotoxins being significant in the mix, because, you know, when you have water damage buildings, yeah. um, we focus a lot on molds and mycotoxins because, you know, through... Um, you know, the animal and, you know, agriculture literature, we know a lot about mycotoxins and how toxic they are. So that's always a focus. But, you know, I always go back to some of the writings of Jack Thrasher and Kay Kilborn, and they would talk about all the elements in a water damage building, as did the World Health Organization yeah. report. So, um, so, you know, what we definitely know is that man is not meant to live in wet, moist, indoor environments. Um, and when you're in those, uh, any number of things go wrong with the building and with your health. So, um, but the fever pattern made me think of endotoxins. And we had had another interesting thing um, with that after we'd moved and we were working with a remediator and, and the entire home was gutted pretty well, taken yeah. to studs and you know really extensive remediation. Um, but there was a piece of sort of a beautiful antique dresser that he had assured us had been cleaned inside and out, would be brought it into the home uh, where we had been doing well. That night, um, I woke up, but, you know, I sweated all night. I woke up feeling drunk and our six-year-old daughter had spiked a 104 and a half fever and we figured it out. It was very easy. She got a little bit of fresh air. You know, I got some fresh air. She was, you know, I think she was, you know, in soccer practice that afternoon. I mean, this was not yeah. a flu or an illness, right. it was just an immune response to something we had become very sensitized to. And it was, it, in that case, it's because the inside of the drawers were not sealed wood. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so got I, it permeated. Mm -hmm. I, I share that lesson because, you know, people always ask, what can I bring? And you know, the, the honest answer is we don't really know what you can bring or yeah. tolerate, but what we know, you know, what I tell people is nobody has ever come back regretting bringing too little into their new environment. You know, a lot of people have, you yeah. know, regretted bringing too much. So, um, and that was, you know, very fortunate because we had only introduced one item and um, we had a very impressive reaction that resolved was, by yeah. removing that item. So, um so that's, you know, that the immune system is complicated. I mean, you it know, is, we, and it will kind of, if we're listening, and like you said, sometimes there's so many variables, but I love that you bring that up because I walk such a careful line. I don't want to be the doc that says, oh my gosh, you have to leave your house 100% of the time and yeah. you have to get rid of everything because that's just not true. But things yeah. like mattresses that you sleep on, I'm pretty adamant about, yeah, you know what? It's a few thousand dollars, but you're sleeping on that for eight hours. I don't want you to take that risk. And books, papers, mementos, um, we don't know for sure, but I always say store them because you can always pull them back into your environment. But you and I both have those experiences where patients don't get well because they hang on to things that could be 
contaminating their environment. It's so hard because you don't want to be that person who says, number one, you have to leave your house because not everybody does. And number two, you have to get rid of all your things because not everybody does. But that's a real example. I had the same with my medical textbooks, 20 years of, a, you know, 15 years of a library. I, I love books. So that was really hard, but I had to store them. And when I opened up the bin, immediately I had horrible symptoms, headache and rashes and things. So I knew that those were contaminated. I have had since then some special remediators say there's some ways that you can clean paper. I don't know. I mean, ozone, they say some of those. I, I haven't found a consistently great way to clean porous items like paper. I don't know about you, but I don't think there is. My, my husband was the first to kind of go through that because he really enjoyed books. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and this was, you know, this was 2006 that we discovered the problem. And, um, but he had looked into options then and he concluded, you know, wasn't going to work. There's been a study since then that I referred to a lot, the Scandinavian remediation article. Um, it's referenced in my papers and it's, it's available online. But um, they tested, they deliberately contaminated materials with aspergillus and stachybotrys mm -hmm. and tested all the normal things to see if it would kill the mold and destroy the mycotoxins. And nothing adequately did both even. I was surprised because I always thought mold is pretty easy to kill, but the problem is the chemical mycotoxins that have now been created. Um, but nothing worked. Um, the, the best was boric acid and ammonia, but that still wasn't great. Mm -hmm. So um, whenever I hear these stories of, you know, you're going to wipe it down with this or you're going to do it, um, you know, you might be able to wipe it down to a level that you will tolerate. I don't know the answer to that, but, you know, it's not going to remove everything. But it, what you say is very important because you do not want to create people who are afraid of everything. You want to empower them to have a problem-solving approach. You know, our problem-solving brain is yeah. much better than our panicked brain. Yes. And you really cannot help be panicked when this first happens. Both, I think there are effects of the toxins, mm -hmm. but also just all at once, you know, everything you've ever thought about life and, you know, safety and yeah. security at home or at work, you know, is now shot. And, um, and so it's a very tense time. And um, I think if you can coach people through the initial process in a rational, calm, problem-solving way, it's much better for healing. Because if we're in crisis, that's all our body can do is kind of stay there. You know, it yeah. can't really relax and heal. And I totally agree about the bedroom. That's, yeah. that's really a healing place. And that's the place to keep really clean. You know, yeah. sometimes people are moving to places with more than one room. And if they yeah. can, you know, shut the bed. sanctuary. Yeah, have their sanctuary yeah. and maybe have their iffy room. Yeah, you know? yeah, like in, or a garage. You can always put stuff in the garage if you are concerned. So I love that because again, I oh totally agree with what you've said. My, that's my experience too. That part of why I got well was I really got rid of the porous materials. Not again, not everybody has to, but I think that there's there's a spectrum of vulnerability that we see, and we see this with chemicals and other environmental toxins. And you and I are probably a little bit more the canaries that are slightly more sensitive than average, and then most of our patients are as well. Uh, but there's a whole range, and so depending on the sensitivity and even the mast cell activation and some of these other things that are playing into this um, or the limbic system, they all play into the reactivity. Some people can't even tolerate the slightest twinge of exposure. And the sad thing is we live in a world that there's mold indoors and outdoors. And certainly because of some of the fungicides that have been used in things, we actually have a lot more toxicity now indoors than we used to because we're having off-gassing. You know, maybe I'll ask you to talk a little because you are an environmental toxin expert. What are some of the other things that could be in the environment besides mold and the water damage slew of toxic soup? There's also VOCs from building materials and other things. What else do you coach your patients on um, avoiding or being cautious about in their home? Well, the VOCs are a biggie because um, I don't know if you've had patients like this, but um, patient who's gotten sick from a moldy home is now uh, determined to not have that problem again. So they find the absolute newest, you know, freshest home they can find that is off gassing. And so then they're in a non moldy home that is off gassing from aldehyde and other VOCs and they're not feeling great. They may have a different set of symptoms, a lot yeah. of times respiratory symptoms and, um, so that's really the hard part. You know, it's the, the million dollar question is, how do I know this next place is safe? 
And the answer is you will not know for sure. However, this is, I think, also um, maybe similar to how you coach your patients. But that first environment that really got you, your immune system had quite a bit of time to really like respond to that sort of stew of things in that environment. So it's got a hair trigger for that. You know, we talk similar to a peanut allergy, even though the mechanism is a little different. But yeah. so even a little like that dresser that, you know, we weren't even that close to, I mean, you know, you don't, you just open it once in a while. That was enough at that time for our immune system to really overreact. And um, so, you know, as a general rule, making as clean a break as you can the first time while not making any permanent decisions while you're in stress, you know, but just taking these things out of your breathing living space until you can sort it out. Um, and, um, and then after that, it's very rare that you're going to have to, you know, avoid materials, even if you get another yeah. exposure, because it, you know, and I look back on that too, you know, I, I've gone traveled all over the place yeah. and, um, I haven't thrown anything out or, you know, since that first exposure. So um, if you keep doing that, then it's very stressful. It's just very stressful if you're, you never feel safe. So, you know, you really have to balance that reality that the immune system is, is very, very sensitized initially and that, um, you know, with getting away from that and treating, you know, for at first the sensitivity increases yes. as you know for somewhere six months to a year i remember you know wanting to live on santa cruz island or anywhere you know, just yeah. get away from yeah. everything because you're really really wired to respond to just about everything but um that improves you know in time and um so you it's you know you just have to give people the confidence to you know know that this is real and their immune system is reacting but that also sometimes it can react just sort of like, oh, I, this could be bad, <laughs> you know, and then it seems to calm down too. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you chase every reaction and every feeling that keeps you out of getting in a more relaxed state that's more conducive to healing. Mm. Gosh, I, I really appreciate you mentioning that because I always describe it as my simplistic way of thinking of it, but it's almost like our buckets, our toxic load is like a bucket that we're born with and some of us have a smaller capacity to detox because of genetic polymorphisms and things, just some genetic variants. And because of that, then our bucket starts to fill up and you and I both had an experience where we got sick because our bucket started to fill and overflow to uh, manifest in symptoms, brain fog, fatigue, um, the, for you, the fevers um, and all of the other skin rashes, irritation, all the other stuff. Yeah. And so then as we start to um, find out that's the issue and we get out of the environment, we start to detoxify. And next we'll talk about what kinds of things you do for patients who are in their detox. But you're doing that stuff and then your bucket level of water is going down. And when you start to give that margin back, that's when you can start to heal. But you also, I, I've heard the term unmasking where you, in that beginning, like you said, six months or so, super common to be hypersensitive and extra sensitive. And I was like you, I actually had a lot of trouble that first year. Um, and now I travel, well, used to before COVID, but I traveled all over and lots of times in moldy places. And I would just take some charcoal and maybe feel a little down for a few hours, but no big deal. It didn't take yeah. me off my course at all. And I knew like you what to do to get me back on track really quickly, like binders or glutathione. Um, so how do you start with patients? Say they have a moldy environment, they've moved or remediated and they're in a more safe place. What would be some of your very basic things that you would do to help them get well? Um, so the initial thing, yes, they're in a new place. Um, and um, it's, you know, what, what would I look for is good enough to heal yeah. because, you know, perfect is, um, you know, you're not going to find perfect. And, you know, a place where when there's not fires or outdoor problems that they can spend time outdoors and um, depending on, you know, how sick they are when they, they come in, you can, you know, adjust what you what you do initially. But if somebody was sick, but able to do treatments, the things I would do would be binders, um, usually, usually charcoals enough. Um, but, you know, you can certainly add in cholestyramine, uh, clay things, you know, if they need more binders. Um, I uh, really, really encourage and spend a lot of time coaching people through getting a liposomal glutathione on board because yeah. yes, 
there can be detox reactions, but you know, like with all of us, if we expect something, it is much easier to take than, you know, if we don't expect it. So I probably over <laughs> emphasize that, you know, so that when it happens and it doesn't happen to everybody, some people can, you know, uh, get the glutathione going and just get better without ever getting that. But a lot of people, they're just so backed up that, you know, even a little bit all at once, you've got this, you know, f flood release of toxins. Yeah you know, mainly into the gut, which is why the binders are such a big deal. So, you know, having the binders for me twice a day yeah. is about enough for binders. Four times is you know, how many people could do anything four times. Exactly. A day? <laughs> it's not going to happen. But the difference between once and twice a day is a biggie. You know, yeah. I found that the actual dose of the binder is less important than getting it twice a day. So, um, so then the liposomal glutathione, then if there's, you know, um, uh, nasal and sinus symptoms um, or cognitive symptoms, mm -hmm. I'll encourage um, uh, nasal glutathione because that, you know, if you lay with your head back, you know, that uh, we, at least all of the evidence is that gets into the brain and it also helps with the uh, nasal and sinus symptoms. And then um, for some people, a nasal antifungal, like a nasal itraconazole, mm -hmm. because, you um, you know, as uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Alan McDaniel said, it's like being allergic to cats and having cat hair in your nose. You know, it's not invading, it's not doing anything, yeah. but your immune system is just constantly, you know, wanting to fight that. And so if you can, you know, ramp that down, then that can help too. Um, you know, skin wise, since you're gonna be trying to get people sweating more, uh, charcoal soap can be helpful because you're, you know, they're just sweating more out. And, you know, a lot of people get skin irritation initially when they detox. So um, helping with that can help. Sometimes there's um, rashes that are kind of unclear and using the ketoconazole, like a 2% shampoo as a body wash in the shower where you just leave it on about 90 seconds. Um, can help with that. And it's very obvious if it helps, it helps. They can stop, they can go back on it. And then there's like the uh, the lifestyle things that are important. And that is initially, depending on where a person is, they're fatigued, they're mitochondrial, yeah. <laughs> not at peak form. You kind of gauge, you know, what they can do without causing post-exertional malaise or, and but everybody needs to move because our venous and limbic, I mean, lymph system do not have a pump. They rely on musculoskeletal activity. So I, um, you know, I find a way of, you know, getting them to move, stretch, bounce on a rebounder, you know, whatever it takes initially to do that. Uh, sauna, you know, since public saunas are probably not going to be a thing for the foreseeable future, I've been encouraging people to get, um, you know, there's there's a good one that's um, that's uh, fairly inexpensive and plugs into a regular outlet and works really well. So sauna is a biggie. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, at this point, um, that was even what Dr. Elliot uh, told me at the beginning. She had a sauna in her office and I, you know, asked her what it was. And she thought that would be probably one of the most effective and cost effective treatments yeah. I could do. And, and that was true. I did a lot, a lot of sauna initially. And I still do it, but not as much because yeah. we also can sweat from sports. So, yes. but, um, and, you know, things like that, uh, Epsom salt baths, if, if they can do that. Diet, I kind of focus on a few biggies. If people, you know, because this is such a bummer and you're so restricted anyway. <laughs> so if you really, really restrict the diet extremely, then, uh, you know, the people who have to do that already know they have to do that. Yeah. You know, it's because they've reacted to things and then you can find things they might react to on testing. But uh, gluten and dairy are kind of biggies that are probably worth a try, you know, mm -hmm. to do stay off of and then i actually encourage fermented foods for those who can tolerate it yes because we know that those foods are alive and it's the way our ancestors got yes. probiotic you know it's just that you know it, it's it's just a good way to get the probiotics um and then uh you work on trying to correct some of the nutritional deficiencies that have just built up over time like magnesium, yeah. um, uh, B vitamin support, it is, almost everybody needs that. Um, the um, 
even uh, you know injections of B12, like a mental yeah. B12 injection, because um, orally or sublingual doesn't work as well. And you just kind of you know work through that vitamin D, zinc, fish oil, some CoQ10, you yeah. know whatever they need. And, and you understand that some things you're going to feel a result from really quick, like a methyl B12 shot, if you're going to feel it. Other things like magnesium are just long-term players, kind of probably forever players to some yeah. degree, you know, yeah. that you're just going to need and they will take a while to build back. So, um, you know, so those, a-, a general approach that, um, uh, you know, uh, works for the majority of people and, you know, then of course you have some people who have, you know, different problems they have to address. You can target. Yeah. What a great, I mean, that's a fantastic overview and I agree on all points. And a couple of things I just want to mention, you and I both agree that the sinuses can be a reservoir. Not mm-hmm. all docs do, but I have found um, a lot of the patients who've come to me and had some old treatment have never addressed this biofilm and this reservoir. Yeah. Yeah. And not everybody is colonized, but some people are. And like you um, mentioned, it's just this uh, irritant that's yeah. constantly there and it's pretty darn close to the brain. So, you you know, it's a really good thing. Like you said, I often use antifungal. Sometimes I'll even use like over-the-counter GSC nasal spray, which is a great oh, yeah. film. Um, that. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And then also <laughs> the antifungal. Yeah. GSC ointment is awesome for the skin. Oh, that's a great. That's very handy. Any, any impetigo-y looking yeah. thing or skin, even fungally looking thing. Yeah. yeah. Well. Oh, that's it. And I love your ketoconazole topical. I've done some topical lamisil, same thing um, uh, for the antifungal effect on the skin. And then, like you said, the glutathione, one little pearl that's interesting, because I was one of those as well that didn't tolerate glutathione very well in the beginning. So a couple of things uh, related to that. First of all, your glutathione is depleted with mold exposure. That's one of the things mold does is just tank the whole detox system. So you're going to be deficient when you have a mold exposure. You need that. If in the beginning you don't tolerate, you can do precursor like NAC, vitamin C, glycine, glutamine, sometimes those will be enough to get you started. Um, And then like you said, Dr. Hope, the small doses, sometimes just minuscule pumps or pinches or whatever to get you going. But the other thing, um, and if you haven't seen my um, video with Dr. Bob Miller most recently, I don't know what episode, but we talked about NADPH being depleted in the process of of, uh, treating aspergillus and mold toxicity. And so one of the things, and that is a key for recycling glutathione from the oxidized from the reduced to oxidized form and so because of that sometimes giving a little bit of NAD um, can help that glutathione be better tolerated especially as people get into the detox and that was kind of a a pearl that I've learned in the last few years that I didn't know in the beginning super helpful and like you said B vitamins in general because methylation is part of the detox a lot of these people have impaired methylation so giving methyl donors in a good general B complex is good and then magnesium so key to every function I mean, yeah. if I had like one multi or one vitamin, it'd probably be magnesium or vitamin D, but those two. And, you know, part of our problem is our soils are so depleted that an apple today, even if it's organic and beautiful and from the farm, it's probably a fifth of the magnesium content as it had 100 years ago. So we're, most of us are walking around depleted in magnesium. Absolutely. Um, so that is so helpful. Um, and then you mentioned a little bit about rashes and stuff. Have you seen, to me, with all this environmental toxic load, one of the consequences I've seen is more irritation, like mast cell activation on top of everything else we see. Do you see an increase in that in your patients nowadays? Yeah, I'd say over the years, yes. More and more yeah, that load. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm sure like you, if you think about 10, 20 years ago, I used to get very simple autoimmune cases that would resolve in a few months. And now yeah. I rarely see, I feel like there's layers and it's part of our environmental toxic load. Maybe you could just speak a little bit of that to that because you have been the president of the American Academy of Environmental mm-hmm. Medicine and very, very involved on the front lines of environmental medicine. Um, and I wonder what your just overall thoughts are about our toxic load. Like how is that affecting our patients? I, well, I think you described the rainbow perfectly, and that's sort of how we describe it uh, in terms of how people get ill, because, you know, most of us don't really feel as we're building up with toxins and stress and infection, and uh, and then not keeping up draining our rain barrel yeah. with the right nutrition and glutathione. So, um, so most people, you know, don't notice anything till they're overflowing, and just like you said, as you're first getting better, it's always up and down because if you're just a little bit above 
you know, your, your theoretical rain barrel, right. you know, but you're, you feel okay. You feel good. You just don't have a reserve. You right. know, so then anything happens. And, you know, yes, the world have, has added, as we all know, tens of thousands of toxins yes. in a relatively short period of time. Um, and, you know, the encouraging side is people really now seem to be getting it. Yeah. Like, they kind of get it. Like, you know, it's just a different, you know, we're, we're not in the better living through chemistry mode. Right. <laughs> anymore, like so. go Monsanto mode. We're really yeah, not there yeah. anymore. <laughs> so they're getting it. You know, they may not know or think of everything that they're doing. And, you know, we can kind of help them, you know, go over that. But, um, but it all contributes. And that's why I, you know, recommend avoidance of other toxins. Um, because, you know, anything that your detox system doesn't have to deal with, freeze it up you know, for the things you can't avoid. So you have, you know, so you have some resilience there. And, it, you know, and as you sort of restore and get everything optimal nutritionally, you'll have more reserve. But um, I think the question was uh, more toxins or, I think there are more, yeah. but I think there's more awareness too. So yeah. I think, um, you know, uh, I think there's a little bit of both. Good. You know, I think we're kind of switching from just more and more and more and more yeah. chemicals, you know, to, um, you know, and I'm sure, you know, probably the, the market supports that, that less yeah. toxic products are probably doing a lot better. You yeah, know. people are starting to, well, I grew up on a farm in Illinois, so I know well, yeah. before we ever knew about glyphosate and atrazine, and I was exposed to all these, I actually think there's a good chance that some of those contributed to my breast cancer and endocrine type of thing at 25, so that's all oh, connected. Wow. Yeah. But what really neat what happened is this is conventional farming in Illinois in the 70s and 80s. And my family now, um, they actually have completely gone GMO free on all of their corn and soybeans. And they're partially organic, which is kind of unheard of in the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of been neat in the sense of my cancer. It wasn't the cause of all the changes, but it definitely opened their eyes to start to look. And my brother's pretty progressive. He's kind of like the functional soil guy. Like he understands nutrients and soil quality. And so we talk a lot and it's kind of fun because he does farming and agribusiness and I do medicine, but there's actually correlatives of the quality of the soil and the chemicals used and all of these things as well. And it's, to me, it's fascinating because really the soil health is a reflection of our microbiome. So when we yeah. start, you know, getting the good soil and the healthy soil and the more organic crops, and then like you said, people are starting to demand with their dollars. So if you're out there listening, one way you can improve this and change this is actually choose to buy organic. And it's better to, I always say, it's better to pay the farmer than the hospital. Yeah. So yeah. people think they can't yeah. afford it, but how can you not afford it? You know, so choosing those clean air, clean water, clean food is really, really critical. Um, yeah. What about air quality? We talked a little bit. There's so much more than just mold in our air. Do you recommend air filter filters for your patients or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Those help a lot. Indoor air, you know, having a filter, usually with a HEPA and a carbon component. And that's all. You know, you, you don't want ozone in your air. You know, I know some physicians treat certain yep. things with ozone, and that's different. But you def everybody agrees it's a respiratory irritant, and you don't want it in your air. So, um, so yes, filters are very helpful, um, both measurably, you know, you have people yeah. who have particulate meters can actually see the, the particulate counts going down and just the stories from patients, you yeah. know, it's very helpful. And, um, you know, I tell people, you know, I just run filters all the time, but I also get a lot of fresh air. And is that perfectly efficient? No, but, you know, it's... Um, you know, I, it's okay. It doesn't yeah. use up that much electricity. It really doesn't. And, um, and so, you know, I think you get, some people get hung up on, well, if I'm going to have fresh air and a filter and, you know, it's, you can manage that. You know? Yeah, I, I agree 100% with you. I have two air filters at home and five at the office. And it's funny because yeah. you and I both with California and Colorado, we've had a lot of smoke that's really affected ourselves and our patients. Yeah. But I can honestly say, and I actually have some lung inflammation, permanent damage from the mold. I will always like my pulmonary function tests are never completely normal. And they may never be because of that um, inflammation damage. I function yeah. fine, but I should be someone with the smoke that would be highly affected by it. But because I have air filters everywhere, I haven't really noticed a whole lot, except if I hike on a really bad day, um, which is amazing to me because it's such a big inflammatory trigger. And in the smoke, uh, like according to Dr. Klinghart, there's aluminum and heavy metals and all kinds of other toxins in the smoke, besides just the burning of a tree. <laughs> so we're getting lots of exposures that way. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and they're actually, um, you know, there's some uh, people here locally where we had a really big fire and they ended up with a bunch of ash and particulates in their attics and they haven't wow. all found them. Uh, so I had a patient who knew, you know, that he was having a reaction and, and did eventually find it. But there's, there's, you know, many others that, yeah. uh, you know, even though the insurance, you know, helped clean and stuff, they didn't really, you know, re find it all. So, you know, getting that all cleaned out of the attics and the nooks and yeah. crannies, even af long after the fire is over is important. Oh, I couldn't agree more because that building um, area is so critical to have a good, um, and like we said, it doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect can be the enemy of the good, yeah, but if you want a decent, yeah, right? And so some people are like paralyzed um, because they're yeah. like, oh, I can't get a perfect. You'll never get a perfect because there's going to be mold in our environment, but you want a place that's good enough for your body yeah. to start to calm down and to heal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is so fun and we're so uh, in line. One thing you mentioned that I wanted to just ask you about because I've used it before, but you mentioned nasal glutathione. Is that something you prescribe or do patients get that themselves and use a certain form? Um, and you don't have to give doses or anything, but what's your general principle about nasal? Is it rinses or? Um, no, it's, it's um, a spray and it is prescribed through a mm -hmm. compounding pharmacy yep. or, yep. Uh, you know, various compounding pharmacies. And um, it's, you know, I mean, dosages are, yeah. big, you know, I use sure. about 100 milligrams per ml. And then, you know, you do a few sprays and you just suck enough, you breathe in enough to hold it and then lay back. Mm -hmm. And when you really get it in the right spot, you know, after that five or 10 minutes, you, you will feel head clearing yeah. and you'll feel different. And I usually tell people to experiment a little bit with the right position because everybody's anatomy is a little different. And, um, you know, they can do that three times a day and with exposures. For some yeah. people, it's a biggie to kind of pull them out of exposures, as are trisalts. Um, trisalts yeah. can also be a biggie to get somebody out of an acute exposure. And, you know, the thing I've been kind of mentioning to people now, once they're kind of on track, is to write kind of their, you know, crisis list. Like if their symptoms are coming back, because when they come back, a lot of times they aren't, we aren't thinking clearly. You know, so two things happen. You just subtly start to slump more by little by little every day. And, yeah. you know, and then people, you know, and you kind of forgot to do whatever the B12 or the glutathione. But also it's good to have something available to go to when, you know, if you did have an accidental exposure and your body's doing all the immune things it's doing. And, you know, that's not the time when you're thinking the most clearly. So it's yeah. good to yeah. kind of have your little, okay, this is the things I do. Yeah, you know, I used yeah. to have an emergency travel pack in it. It contained charcoal, and I would create um, my own biocide nasal spray, which is a great biofilm disruptor. You can also buy GSE nasal spray, or I'm sure you could take the glutathione. But those were kind of like rescues if I got into a hotel room. And then you can actually get products or little. Um, I know Haven um, Mist has a, and again, I have no association with any of these products. Has a travel like little fogger, and then sometimes you you can do the home biotic, or you can do the surface guard, or you can do the. There's a bunch of different products products out there that you could actually travel with a little spray bottle um so because it's interesting i went to maui last year and had a terrible mold exposure and i was in there for seven days but of course with the windows open and knowing what to do i was actually st i stayed there i had a massive exposure and i was overall okay because again you and i kind of know now and that's the great thing what we want to do is empower our patients because we are going to get exposures and what we want to do is decrease reactivity and then empower you guys to um, have tools um, there. So Dr. Hope, this has been so much fun and such great information. One thing I wanna be sure people can find is your website. And then also you've written a lot of papers that are so wonderful. You've made a real difference in the literature by publishing. Um, are those on your website or where can people yeah, find they it? Are. They are, and yeah. I learned a lot through writing those papers. And I just very quickly wanted to yeah. mention Early on in this process, um, I often did travel with one of those desktop air filters. Yeah. And um, and I, I just saw in CVS, you know, because of COVID, there's more awareness and they're, they're selling little desktops. So, um, you know, yeah. I don't need to travel with those anymore, but people in the early stages of recovery and, you know, if we get back to being able to travel, um, that can be helpful, you know, taking it to your hotel room or wherever you're going. So... 
I love that. And I have to just tell a funny story because I, well, now, again, now we're not really traveling, but in, when, in the days when we did travel, I would always joke because I would have like a, two suitcases sometimes for a weekend. And, and, and I said, it's okay to be high maintenance if you're high performance because one yeah, of those suitcases, <laughs> yeah, one of those yeah. suitcases would sometimes contain a small blender and an air filter and some food supply. Like, so literally like one suitcase might be just my supplies so that I wouldn't get um, <laughs> ill. <laughs> Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, yeah. you know, an air filter in a, you know, if you're stuck in a place for a bit, you know, yeah. then, you know, get the air the best you can. So Exactly. I stopped apologizing for my lot of, because it wasn't all shoes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I would have TSA. I had a metal style desktop and that always got looked at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, exactly. What is that? These yeah. things are what we, yeah. yeah. Um, but where would people do? Oh, yeah, but sorry, my, I do have a website. It's JeanettePopeMD.com. Yeah. Okay, and you um, said the, re, the articles are all um, on your website, so people can look you up there. And yeah. you, you are, you're in Santa uh, Monica or Santa Barbara? Santa Barbara. Okay, Santa Barbara. Barbara. Oh, one of my favorite places to visit. Yeah, it's um, nice. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It has been just a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate all the great information you've shared. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs>